Good afternoon and welcome to Inside Entrepreneurship, a webinar series hosted by the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative, the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Alliance, and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas for today's conversations, Problems Worth Solving with Fabio Rosati and Jeff Reed. Our host, Jeff Reed, is the founding director of the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative and professor of entrepreneurship at the McDonough School of Business. As Georgetown's entrepreneurship programs have grown under Reed's leadership, the school has been ranked among the best in the world for entrepreneurship by the Financial Times, Bloomberg Business Week, and others. Reed is a catalyst for entrepreneurship economic development and a well-known leader in entrepreneurship education. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of Strategic Engagement and Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few tips and reminders. This conversation is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel, and you will receive the link in a follow-up email. Jeff and Fabio will take questions at the end of their discussion. Please send in your questions as you have them using the questions section of the webinar control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please submit those concerns via the questions section of the control panel as well. Without any further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Jeff. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I really appreciate that. We're excited to be here again for our Inside Entrepreneurship webinar. And uh, today we're gonna hear from Fabio Rosati, who has been the CEO of companies like Elance and Upwork, uh, has a great experience as an entrepreneur and leader of companies. Uh, we'll hear from him in just a minute. Um, I do want to thank once again our, uh, uh, oh, I want to also put in a plug two weeks from today, we're going to have another webinar session on entrepreneurship as a social movement. That'll be led by three graduates of the class of 2016, the co-founders of Good Partners and Good Projects. These three young men have been uh, working hard on social justice issues in uh, inner city DC, and, uh, and they've recently taken a nationwide tour uh, around issues related to Black Lives Matter. So it'll be interesting to hear from them how their entrepreneurial journey has uh, has turned into a big social mission. Uh, we uh, wanna thank our partners here, the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative and the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Alliance. Together, we're building one big community for entrepreneurship at Georgetown. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna now uh, stop sharing our screen and, uh, and welcome, uh, Welcome, Fabio Rosati. So, Fabio, class of seven, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Good to be here. And if there's uh, any any alums in class of '87, hi guys. All right, yeah. Chime in the question uh, question box if you are an old classmate of Fabio's. Um, so, thanks for being here. I want to hear just a little bit about your background. I know you came from Italy uh, to Georgetown and spent some time in places like Paducah, Kentucky, and uh, talk about kind of how you got from where you grew up to uh, to your early part of your career, which I know was in the consulting industry. Uh, well, very briefly, I, I was very fortunate to be born in a family that had this idea that it would be useful to educate their son in the United States. I, it was an entrepreneurial family. I came from a family of entrepreneurs, and at the time, um, my family had a company that was exporting to the U.S. Um, study, so it made perfect sense. Undergraduate business school, go back to the business and join the family. And it turns out that while I was at Georgetown, um, the business went belly up. My father went bankrupt, and uh, we lost everything. And so all of a sudden, um, I went from thinking, growing up, thinking, of course, that's all I'm going to do, to, oh my God, what will I do? Who am I, and what am I supposed to do with my life? It was a the, the very first midlife crisis, I would suppose, I suppose. And, and, and a good one, uh, looking back, um, because it, 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 it's, I'm, I'm very pleased that I was able to chart my own course as opposed to land uh, in, on, in, in, in the way I would have otherwise. And that led me to Paducah, Kentucky. The first job I could get out of school at the time was 1987. The economy wasn't very good. I didn't have a work permit, and I was a terrible, terrible student and also a terrible job interviewer. Uh, I, I was able to get into a, a, a training program at a company called Ingersoll Rand. And uh, after I was, uh, I took the job, they informed me that my first station in, was in this small town of Mayfield, Kentucky, in the dry county in Kentucky. And that the closest place to live was Paducah, which is about 25 miles away from it. 
uh, that was it. And that's where I started. Um, so from there, um, I discovered that I loved working with engineers. I loved working on the manufacturing shop floor. I was really, really interested in the process of figuring out how to build stuff. Um, and, uh, and eventually I was able little by little to get into consulting and uh, join a very early stage consulting company that had com combined strategy development with implementation. And it was doing very well, but it was very small. It had only 300 employees. So I joined that company in the London office. Um, I was able to... It's just a small transition from Paducah to London. <laughs> yeah. So I skipped the part where I lived in New York City for a little while and yeah. I had a job in insurance, uh, which uh, was also... I learned a lot also, but it was not my passion. And um, so I basically, initial, most of my steps were trying to find where I belonged and what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I, um, the, the, the Gemini consulting experience, this consulting journey um, was where I realized that in order for me to enjoy my work, I had to believe in what I was doing and I had to want to help others. So consulting was good in the, to the extent that the clients that I was working with had real problems that needed to be solved. And to me, that became really fun. All of a sudden, like, okay, how do we help this company? One, one of the clients was Rolls-Royce Motor Cars. How do we help Rolls-Royce build cars faster? It would take them forever, and they would rebuild them literally three times. Uh, let's redesign the whole thing. Another company was British Aerospace, and they were taking years and years and years to, to build these, these planes uh, when and design these planes. So by the time they were actually finally being produced, um, the technology was 10 years old. How can we get seven or eight years out of that development cycle? It was really fun and I really enjoyed it. I'm like, okay, that's what I do. I love to solve problems and I love to work with, with people that are equally focused on a goal. And, uh, and I really enjoyed assembling teams and I was a bit uh, crazy in the, in the sense that I like to work really long hours and, and I lost track of day and night. It was kind of fun. So um, that lasted for, uh, for several years. It carried me for many years. In, um, you know, at some point, the company went from 300 employees to 60,000. Um, we were acquired. We merged with Ernst & Young Consulting. It was, became gigantic, and, uh, and it was a public company, no longer private. Um, and while I had done a lot of fun things and I traveled all over, um, I started to lose passion. I was no longer solving problems with clients, but I was preparing quarterly update calls, budgets, dealing with partners, arguing with each other all the time. The job was very bureaucratic and I was not having fun. I, I, I hit a, a huge midlife crisis in my mid thirties. And I realized I wanted to go back to building stuff and doing stuff that w was fun. And none of these other a bureaucratic things, at least for me, that was that just didn't suck the energy out of my day. So uh, that's how I ended up somehow lucky, um, looking at Silicon Valley as an opportunity. Maybe I could go there and and find a startup to work at. And uh, I I spoke with a group of um, well-known investors, a firm called Kleiner Perkins, and they showed me three different companies. Uh, they were looking for a new CEO, and um, two were large and really well funded. And one was pre-revenue with a little with with capital. They had raised capital during the crazy dot-com uh, times, but they had no revenue, and the team was very very junior. And I realized that most people in my situation would have gone would have gone for the large business with a huge headquarters of of one on one with a big sign and sort of the flag you know all of the contraptions, and none of that resonated with me. Uh, I also wasn't passionate about what they were doing, but this little startup with no revenue was trying to solve a really interesting problem, which was how do we build an eBay for services? How do we build a company that can allow people not to sell things but sell services? online and I thought that could be really cool. Let's go solve that problem. And that, that was how I got into Silicon Valley. And that's, uh, that was Elance, right? So, that was, yeah. so uh, I wanna hear more about that company and kind of what you did to turn it into what it became. But before then, I wanna just ask, what uh, were there skills that you learned from consulting that helped you when you became the CEO? 
uh, later on. So many of our Georgetown alumni or students will go into careers in consulting and uh, and what, what do you think you can get out of that career that can help you when you want to yeah. do something more entrepreneurial? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that consulting is an incredible place to learn the difference between strategy and execution. Um, it's an incredible place to learn how to execute a strategy. So one of the things that I absolutely adored was meeting clients who had a good strategy but did not know how to execute and understand what's getting in the way. Like they have these great visions, but they can't get them done. Why and how do you solve it? And it almost always boils down to people right? and organizations and getting people and organizations to do what they're supposed to do. It's not, it's not getting them to work hard. It's getting them to overcome themselves so that they can do the innovation or change the business model, do the things that they really need to do. I also um, thought it was a, 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 an incredible place to learn who you are and what kind of people you like to work with. Um, when you go to a large organization, that organization imposes a culture on you and you have to conform. Um, but organizations are like greenhouses. We are plants and you know, some of us are orchids and some of us are cacti cactuses and um, we, uh, we thrive in one place and we fill in another. There's nothing wrong with a cactus. It's just don't stick it in the same greenhouse where you have your orchids. It doesn't work. And, um, and so with consulting, the variety of environments that you experience and the number of people you work with, if you pay attention, it'll kind of give you a sense later in life, I have worked better with these kind of people, I enjoy this kind of pace, I enjoy this kind of environment, and so on and so forth. Okay. Some people so, like, yeah, go ahead. And, and in your case, you decided you really wanted to work with a uh, growing company, you know, an earlier stage business. And I, I suspect you probably had other options, right? You maybe could have gone and run a division at another company or a big existing business. Absolutely. But I, I felt, and I, I feel that for me, um, I have a, t a tendency to be disrespectful and I, I hate to use the term, but I disrespect, um, sort of the trappings of power. <laughs> I don't mean to, to to sound political here, but to me, what matters the most is how good you are at what you do and, and, uh, and not that you have a huge office and you have three secretaries and you fly first class. In fact, I'd rather you fly economy even though you're a CEO of a company. And, uh, and if you sit in the middle of the, of the open floor, not that we're going to have open floors for the New York for a while, but that to me is a strong sign of the kind of leader you are and the kind of message you send to people. And I found that most large organizations during that generation, remember that things have changed a lot in the last 20 years. But when I was at the beginning of my career, um, that, was, um, that was prevalent. So I, I worked in New York City, I mentioned for a period of time, and I really didn't like a lot of the pretense that bothered me. So that's why I find myself in more enjoying smaller companies that wasn't the right greenhouse for you so no. uh, so okay let's talk a little bit more about elance so you joined the company not as the founder but as a ceo uh and you were brought in to kind of fix some things that weren't going well so can you tell us about that experience and, and also a little bit more about what the company does uh because you've kind of built a career since then around roles and important companies in the gig economy so maybe help people understand kind of how the business works yeah, so uh, the company, remember the difference between strategy, execution, and then executing strategy. There's three different things, right? So the team at Elance was really good at executing. It was really terrible at defining a strategy that made sense executing. Like they had this idea and they could build almost anything. I had some unbelievable, the founders was one of the most talented product and engineering leaders. I, it's phenomenal. And the team, just to give you an idea, when I arrived, I noticed in the first week that um, there were pillows in people's cars outside in the parking lot. And I'm like, wow, there are all these cars with pillows. What the hell is going on? And then I asked, why are there all these pillows in cars? And I hope oh, because people go and sleep there at night. So they come back, you know, they, they take naps and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And I'm used to pulling all nighters because I was a crazy workaholic, but I hadn't seen quite that level of dedication. And um, 
And so the, the, it, it, what I was able to do at Elans is join the team and figure out not just how to build that was there, but rather what should we build, what's going to work, and experiment all, all sorts of different ways to get this idea to market. If, if the vision is that one day people are going to work online, which in, in 2000 certainly was a vision, uh, the one day you could hire somebody remotely, you could collaborate remotely. Remember at the time there were no files, no payment systems, nothing. But you could do all of that. How do we bring that to market? And who are going to be the first customers to use it? And, and then once we have a basic level of experience, how do we upgrade and upgrade up and upgrade? So that was that was really how I got connected with those guys. and. It became a journey. And I remembered, I told Catherine, my wife, who also went to Georgetown, class of 87, um, we'll only go to go to California for three years. Would you, would you mind trying this experience? It's only two to three years. And um, like we, we had moved to Europe and spent two to three years there. And um, she was like, oh yeah, it's just gonna be like that. And it took us 15 years. We were there for 15 years to scale that business. And so the business, you took what had already been a but it already existed it had some real valuable pieces to it but you helped develop a new strategy and the company grew really fast and i think you rebranded that business to become upwork is that right yeah so so this is this is another interesting um well maybe maybe not that interesting but it was another milestone in uh, in the journey um we we build this business. We are a market leader, not the market leader by any stretch. There was another player called Odesk that was giving us a run for our money. Um, had started in a different uh, adjacent space, but was basically merging with the same kind of value proposition that we had. And at some point, it was like, we can't have two companies in this space both doing the same thing, competing literally for the same talent, the same capital, and both aspiring to go public one day without um, with, with, without one of the two companies if losing 50% of the recruiting efforts, financing efforts, et cetera, et cetera, because that's basically what was happening. We were neck and neck. And um, one day um, in Ireland at an, at an event called Web Summit at the time uh, in Dublin, uh, my arch nemesis, the, the leader of this company, Odesk, and I are on the same panel. And after the panel, after we threw grenades at each other and hated each other and all that for quite a while, we decided to go for a walk together. And we talked and we realized that um, maybe there was some alignment around merging. And uh, we tested each other and we agreed that I would organize a lunch um, with with a couple of other folks. and. One thing that led to the other, we decided to merge. And what was interesting about that merger is that um, the this is another huge lesson in entrepreneurship. If you are more passionate about the vision of what's still to be built, and you can get teams of people really focused on what still needs to be built, you can make a merge succeed. If you focus all of your time on what you have built and you try to defend it, it's not going to work. So the paramount thing about bringing people together is always to have something you can rally people around. Call it the windmill. Don Quixote's windmill. You have to have something to go after. Instead of an us versus them kind of battle, it's more of like a now versus the future. Let's all we, together it. we can build a better company. Let's be frank. Neither business is good enough to fulfill the needs of our communities. Neither, if we were really honest and went to talk to any customer, both platforms, say it's okay, it's pretty good, but it could be better because neither company had the resources to do everything well. So why don't we bring the teams together and create something far, far better? And speaking of that, um, Silicon Valley is a very, very competitive market for talent, as you know. You're competing for engineering talent, graduating from top engineering schools, and you have Facebook, you have Google, you have Airbnb, you have everybody coming after you with incredible offers. 
And so you may go to a secondary school and maybe hire somebody from there, bring them in. And as soon as they become good, the recruiters start calling and say, hey, Google wants to double your salary, come and work for Google. How do you keep people together? How do you create loyalty? How do you retain talent during times like 2008 or now, the coronavirus? Um, and I believe that you do it by basically saying the mission is, is more important. You hire for missionaries, not for mercenaries. You carefully focus on their love for the work and you really lead with that vision. And then everything takes care of itself. People will work really hard. They won't need to be managed. They, they, will be, they need to be inspired and all that comes together. So the companies merged and Upwork became, you know, a successful business, had an, a successful IPO, what was it, about two or three years ago. And, uh, and I know at some point in there, you had transitioned out, right? So you grew the company and then you kind of moved back to the East Coast after that three years turned into 15 years. And, uh, uh, and I know that you got involved in a couple of D.C. area businesses, including Snag, right? So tell us about what Snag is and, and how and, and your role there. Um, so before I jump into to Snag a job, I have to just explain what happened. Uh, Upwork was, you know, professionally was just I was so proud of the business. But the entrepreneurial journey to get there what it took out of me as an entrepreneur and out of the, the team that, that built the company it was enormous. It played, a, it had a huge toll and um, it caused a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of tension at home. Was, so for any of you who have been entrepreneurs or are planning to be entrepreneurial, uh, know that it's very difficult to be entrepreneurial. It, it takes a lot. And, um, um, I basically had gotten to the point where finally the company was going to run on its own. Did I was no longer, you know, a key person in the business, meaning if I died tomorrow, the business would have continued. Uh, that which is great for an entrepreneur to get to that point. And um, and so I had the opportunity to, you know, with Catherine and I, it's just like if you, if I go pub if I sign up to take the company public, I'm stuck here for another few years, and our marriage it probably will dissolve. We won't make it. So I had to make that change. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, that led me to move back east. And, uh, and to take what my daughter called the leap of faith. My daughter, who also went to Georgetown, was instrumental in me in you know making this decision. She said, "Dad, um, it's funny. I get I get emotional when I think about it." But she said, "Dad, have you heard of a leap of faith?" And I said, "Sure. What do you mean?" She said, you, "It's a leap of faith. You have to jump and you have to hope you land in a good place." And um, and so with that leap of faith, I took the leap of faith and we left that business, we left our community, and we moved back east, and uh, we restarted our life. And it was good. And I, I think every entrepreneur should be able to take the leap of faith, both in the business when you're jumping in and also when you need to jump out because you need to know when the time comes. That's great. So, yeah, so you now spend most of your time in uh, New York, uh, not not in the city, but outside the city. Right. And and also in D.C. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you continued your work with gig economy businesses. and. Uh, uh, so maybe yeah. Yeah. tell us yeah. about so, Snag a Job yeah. and how you so, played a lead role there. So what happened is as I moved back east, I'm like, okay, I uh, we're met, we're back east. I'm no longer going to sign up to do these entrepreneurial things the way I did before because more important that I, that I value um, our family life and um, what do I have to offer and how can I help elevate others and. Um, a little bit at a time, I started talking to a variety of entrepreneurs. One, I, I, I met Don Berger, who you know well, um, because I went to see him to talk about the Georgetown Tech Alliance while I was in the Valley. I, had, I was one of the co-founders of the Georgetown Tech Alliance and I helped build that organization from four of us to over a thousand people. And I thought, let's do this, let's help start this thing. But instead of me doing it, let me go recruit a few folks and let them do it on the East Coast. And I walked into Don's office and from 30 minutes, we ended up spending four hours together. And next thing I know is that I'm on the board of his company. 
and little by little I got involved in a bunch of other things. Um, Snag a job was very similar. The, the CEO and the investors in this company had identified uh, a, a strategy P, an opportunity to convert what was an old job board uh, for hourly work with customers like Starbucks and Marriott and The Gap, all of the retailers, restaurants, hotels, the hourly workers would use Naga Job together with you know Indeed and others. Um, but the idea was let's turn that into a marketplace where you can actually hire hourly workers on demand and let's see if we can do what the guys at Upwork did. So I was brought in as a as, as a potential helper in that process as a board member to advise the CEO and the team. And then um, and I've been doing that for the last two years. I had unfortunately. I say unfortunately, I don't have any regrets, but it's it was a difficult time for the company to step in temporarily as a CEO um, and remind myself of what it's like to be an, a true entrepreneur for about nine months. And in those nine months, I, I was able to rebuild the team, hire a fantastic leadership team, and, and, and then immediately go back to advisory role. So, Right. And, and, and I know one of the one of the things that you've told me about these businesses is how much you appreciate how they help people in the gig economy, right? The gig economy often uh, creates challenges for workers and, uh, and you know, their ability to have health insurance and, and challenges like that. So how, how, is, how, do the, how do those problems relate to kind of your interest in working with businesses like this? Yeah, um, which goes to, now we're talking about the real purpose of this call, um, purpose in work. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier was mission, right? In order to lead with a mission or unite teams around a mission, um, you really are doing it around purpose. Uh, you, you can't be mission oriented without having, without purpose. The two don't come, it, just, it doesn't make any sense. And um, businesses, you know, and almost every business should define a purpose that is more than just growing revenue and making money because those two things, as, as Mark Twain taught us many years ago, um, are they don't motivate people. Right? Tell After a while, it, making money when you reach a point where you have enough, it's just not motivating enough, at least for most humans. And, um, and so I found that the work, the, the gig economy represented a way to help individuals who couldn't commute to work or who couldn't hold a full-time job or who needed extra income to be a very important part of, of work if, if we could use technology to make it happen, to enable people. I'll give you one, uh, right now I'm about to go into a detour um, and talk a little bit about living wage. Uh, there's a huge debate on the living wage, but it's a fact if you do any analysis, if you talk to Professor Carnevale at Georgetown, over the last 25 years, the uh, average income of, of the lower end of the workforce has remained steady while costs have continued to go up. And so you have a lot of people that are working an honest 40 hours a week, um, and they're not making enough to support themselves or their families. So you can have somebody working at an Amazon warehouse today, 40 hours a week, still needing another 10 or 20 hours, um, and therefore having to do the extra work. And um, there are people that can, for, for physical reasons, or because they're caretakers, or because they live in low, low uh, employment areas, because their local factories and their local stores have been shut down over the last 20, 30 years, they need work. The work, there's plenty of work in San Francisco, for example, but not a lot in Maine. So you can use technology to create these bridges and connect people. And I, I personally thought that it was incredibly motivating and worthwhile. And, um, and by the way, you can build good businesses around it too, but that's first, like are we, are we, are we building something worthwhile? And yeah. the same thing with hourly work. When I, when I uh, chose to join Snag a Job uh, from the outside, some people that I talked to were like, well, it's a really old, job board has been around for 20 years what the hell are you doing what about all the cool sexy ai stuff et cetera, et cetera, that you could be doing and and to me it was like wait a minute hourly workers are you know 50 million americans are hourly workers they're not getting any representation they are not um 
nobody's really talking on their behalf. They don't have the, the benefit of a LinkedIn profile. They don't have the benefit of Glassdoor for reputation. Like if you go to work for a Chick-fil-A and the manager of your local Chick-fil-A is a total jerk, nobody knows. And there's no accountability for that. Um, and, um, and nobody's advocating for some of their needs. So what if Snag a Job could not only build a great business, but use a little bit of that influence over time to publish you know, the best employers, the best locations, the, the best policies for workers, the most important needs of hourly workers, wouldn't that be powerful? And that is um, the, the, what, I, what I mean by bringing purpose into work. And just as another, just to follow on uh, about the gig economy, and then we can switch gears a little bit, but uh, our, we do have a few questions from the audience. And one of those is just kind of, what do you think about the future of the gig economy and how does COVID impact what's happening to so many people uh, who need those hours and those opportunities? Yeah, uh, it's hard to, to make predictions without caveating that, you know, we're, it's all of any of us can make these predictions where none of us knows the future. But there's no question that uh, while we all probably miss, you know, working in an office and seeing our colleagues and having, you know, it's the social interactions of the workspace, none of us is going to go back to work in the same way we used to. Working from home is going to be just as acceptable and just as mainstream when possible as, as working from the office. And that's, I think, very, very good. Um, and some companies have been doing it for years. And my previous company was almost, you know, 70% remote. Um, Snag a job went from two primary offices to completely virtual within the space of two weeks and business is doing fine, even, even with the economy. And this, people are just as productive. So I think that that everybody agrees that's not going to change. Um, I, I think things will more or less go back to normal if, if the pandemic is beat, beat, meaning there's a vaccine and there's a cure, everything's going to go right back to where it was with this more, more comfort level with remote work and, and on demand. But if we don't, and there's a lot of you know, doubt about whether this thing actually will be around with, with us for many more years, and I think entire industries are going to be transformed. For example, restaurants are going to be turning to delivery businesses fundamentally. Um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna turn kitchens into you're basically going to outsource your meal to restaurants as a way of living, and very rarely go to a restaurant. Yeah. That kind of thing. Thank you for that. Sure. I was thinking, I was even thinking that, you know, the so-called food trucks, they're going to turn into, I think they're going to maybe pass a lot or allow them to become bars. So you're going to have outdoor bars that show up in your neighborhood and serve beer because that's going to be needed. People are going to want that. Could be a nice innovation. Uh, so, so the issues, so you've kind of been a part of several of these different companies. And I know right now you're trying to figure out what your next move is going to be. You know, how, how do you decide what kind of project you want to get involved with? Yeah, it goes back to purpose. So uh, I thought I'd share with you some some of the things that I've gotten involved with just to, to show how it's possible if you, with a little bit of uh, effort, to combine um, purpose and, and, and entrepreneurship. So I met uh, an entrepreneur who realized that many people who are blind um, could use FaceTime to, to, to call a friend or a volunteer to read things for them. Like they go into a store and they don't know when the milk is expiring. They want to buy a product, but are the eggs expired or not? They can't tell. Or they, I, you know, they get on trains and they don't know where their seat is um, and so on and so forth. So they, uh, one story that I heard is they, they use a pregnancy detection test and they can't see it. Uh, it's a very intimate thing for someone and they have to go ask somebody because they can't see it. There's a gazillion examples like long recipes. How much of this and how much of that do I need to use? 
Um, and and he figured out that he could solve that with a with a basically volunteer platform that is using FaceTime like technology. When you need somebody, you tune in and he fires off a call to anybody who's available, and the person tunes in and says, "Sure, I can read that for you," and then be done. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful, wonderful thing, and it's called Be My Eyes. And the guy's building this business and now Microsoft is using it and Google is using it because they're embedding the product in their customer support flows for increased accessibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really cool stuff. And, um, and the, you know, there's a company in Africa, Kujumo, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's one of my favorite entrepreneurial stories. Um, this guy was traveling throughout Africa, the founder, and he realized that people that have cell phones nevertheless walk for miles and miles and miles to buy minutes. They only have a little bit of cash. They run out, they buy 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they walk for miles, they buy 10 more minutes, 15 minutes, because that's all the money they have, and then they walk back. It's a crazy loss of productivity, nonsensical. We thought, what if there was a way to um, lend them the minutes or give them the minutes um, without them having to walk, and if they repay them, they can earn credits and they can earn a the equivalent of a credit score. He's basically launched his business and he got companies to support him, and now the company is a major uh, alternative to our equivalent in the U.S. You know, the experience of the world. Basically, if you re if you get these credits and then you repay us on time, your credit score goes up, and therefore you must be good and over time, you can buy 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, et cetera, et cetera. And this information feeds your credit score. So people are going to start giving a credit card, or maybe you're going to be able to borrow money to, to buy a car, et cetera, et cetera. It's an incredible idea, very helpful. Um, and again, a great business, but also really, really helpful to the community. And the list goes on. I could spend, you know, yeah. 10 hours. Well, you know, a clear, a clear connecting thread between all those is those are companies that are solving problems that you feel are important enough to work on, right? The whole concept, yeah. of, you know, and, and that's what, you know, kind of you're passionate about, right? You've told me it's, it's the entrepreneurial process of building and growing organizations that solve real problems, right? So you're not motivated by making lots of money. And that's, and I think you've already said, that's not what you advise entrepreneurs to, to act towards, right? That's not the goal they should seek. It's more, what is the purpose of what you're doing? I, I think I don't want to be a hypocrite. I like to live well, and, and financial success was a driver in a lot of what I did, especially at the beginning of my life. But um, I think that there is a it, it, I, it is more fun, more worthwhile if you can combine the two, because as someone said to me once, and you, some, you probably taught this in your class, entrepreneurship is a journey. And there's very low probability that you're going to get to destination. You know, in Silicon Valley, only one in a thousand businesses really becomes meaningful. Um, one in a hundred makes it to 10 million in revenue. One in a thousand ever goes public or gets acquired. And the rest either dies along the way or whatever. And if you're going to work really, really hard, might as well be really passionate about the, the journey, not just the destination. Don't do it just for that because the odds are stacked against you, no matter how talented you are. Yeah, and, and so you've you've become successful by building that connection between the purpose. I think you described it earlier as the, a strategy and you know a, a strategy that's built around having a purpose and then executing around that. Are there any are there any steps that you can advise? We've had some questions in the audience about you know how do you do that? How do you take a company and make it successful? And I know that's a complicated question, but are there any kind of tips or uh, uh, steps that you might advise someone when they're approaching a problem the way you have. Yeah, I mean, I, I there are many people that are way more successful than I've been, and um, and so I I will just share with you uh, a few a few platitudes maybe about about what I've learned and what what I'm trying to do still. One, virtually every business can combine its sort of shareholder driven profit maximization goal and some other purpose every business whether you are a you know a, a meat processor 
uh, or, uh, or a retailer, you can find a way to say, let's, let's make sure that our work is purpose purposeful and meaningful in some fashion. The way we treat employees, the way we relate to the community, the way we contribute to something, to the environment. I don't know, but you can really make that part of what you do. And I think the, the entrepreneurs that do that, and they do it sincerely and consistently, have an, have an advantage uh, in, a, in hiring the kind of people that, that you need to be successful. Uh, a lot of, there's a company called Imperative um, that, that was founded by the founder, of, by the writer of a book called The Purpose Economy, Aaron Hurst. And Aaron did a ton of research on, on employee performance and he basically concluded the best employees in terms of productivity and loyalty are the ones that are purpose oriented. He literally dissects employees across very various criteria. There are those that are focused on self advancement, power, and others that are really most about purpose. So purpose is, is so important to getting the right people. Purpose, as I mentioned, is a huge motivator. You you can almost every entrepreneur are gonna, is going to have terrible days. Almost every business is going to have terrible days. Almost every CEO I've ever talked to at some point will break in tears uh, by themselves or with someone because of the pressures and the stress, no matter what. Um, and there is no certainty. Look, at everybody thought Airbnb was going to go public three years ago, um, and it hasn't. And you can imagine, or look at WeWork. And you and I both know some people that went to Georgetown, they were at WeWork, they were already counting their money, and look at what happened to that business. And who knows what's going to happen to WeWork post-COVID. Um, there is no certainty. So success in some way is about the the glue that brings the team together, the foundation of the business, the values. You can't build a great business without a great culture and great values. Um, well, I think inherent in that too, part of what you're what I think you're saying is growing a business that solves a problem can be the most effective way to solve some problems, right? So people think of entrepreneurs who as a uh, kind of a capitalistic you know, perspective, these are people that want to make a lot of money, but it turns out entrepreneurs are often the most effective leaders at solving some problems that we see in the world, right? And you've already described some of the ones that you've seen, so. Yeah, uh, and building on that, Jeff, I would say, I would say that um, you have one way to think about a business, don't think about a business as a machine to make money. Think about the business as a machine to do something better, whatever that is. Put that first. The business has to create a product that is better than something else, right? It's an expression of who you are as an entrepreneur. You have the ambition to do something better, whether it's better ice cream or better app, whatever it is, you're doing it better uh, and you build an entire machine, which we'll call the business, to do that thing better, whatever that is. Um, and the fact that, among other things, it's self-sustaining because it creates enough revenue to pay for itself and continue, that's good. But if you say, I'm building this just from, the, from a spreadsheet perspective, spreadsheet-based businesses are not that fun. I don't think they last. I mean, they may last. There are plenty of examples, but I don't think it's a lot of fun to work at them for an entrepreneur. Well, we're, we're, uh, we're starting to run out of time, but I've got a few comments from our... Uh from our audience here. First of all, a friend of yours from the class of 85, Anna Kressler, Chrysler. Oh, says Anna. Hello. Hi, Anna. And uh, we have a shout out for Paducah, Kentucky, a Georgetown alum who's also spent time there. Um, uh, and I guess related, a couple of questions here I'll try to combine, you know, related to um, Georgetown in particular, you know, can you point to anything you learned at Georgetown that's really been impactful for you as you've kind of gone through your life and career? And, and somewhat related to that is the Georgetown Network. You know, you mentioned the Georgetown Tech Alliance, which you played a key role in helping grow. How can we build a, a network for Georgetown entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs and others in the community to help each other kind of be more successful in life and use those Georgetown values in, in ways that we think are important? Mm -hmm. It's good. So those are a lot of great questions. Well, First pattern recognition goes uh, way back when, at the beginning of the conversation, I mentioned consulting helps develop pattern recognition about the kind of people you like and you don't. You get to see a lot of companies, a lot of teams. Um, Georgetown, uh, when we go to Georgetown, we don't appreciate it because we're too young. Um, but at later in life, I'm like, wow, that was an incredibly high percentage of people that are 
great and that we really enjoy talking to. It's and that it's that we admire or share values with. Um, so that's I think maybe uh, highlighting the value of that network and how 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 for some for the majority of the Georgetown students, but probably not all, it'll be a benchmark and a pattern recognition milestone in their life. Okay, these are the kinds of people I want to spend more time with or I would like to work with. Similarly, the network, as we built the, the, the Georgetown Tech Alliance in the Valley, there was a huge vacuum, right? You had a lot of Georgetown people, but nobody, we couldn't find each other, we couldn't meet, we couldn't do, we couldn't, and, but bringing people together, I was stuck, struck by, in spite of the different backgrounds and the classes and the ages and the, even the industries that everybody was in, there was always that you're in a room with 150 people from Georgetown and you just tend to like almost all of them and it's, it feels really good. So I, I think we should do a lot more of that. And um, today uh, I have a little bit of a sweet spot for for when I see somebody who went to Georgetown, I, I take another look at their LinkedIn and see, you know, I wonder, and maybe, maybe it's implicit bias, which I admit I have sometimes and I wish I didn't. Um, but um, it, it does say something potential about the person. Great. Well, I apologize to our audience members who have asked questions that we don't have time to get to. I appreciate everyone uh, chiming in there. We've had a, a, quite a few. We've tried to answer as many as we could. Uh, and, and I just really want to thank you, Fabio, for your time today. Uh, I do think what you're saying resonates very much with me and I think our audience that entrepreneurs are out there solving problems. And if you think about uh, purpose is your first goal. What are you trying to accomplish to make the world better? Then you can have other types of success along the way. It falls into place. Yeah. yeah. So thanks so much for being with us today. We hope everybody will join us again uh, for our next webinar in a couple of weeks. And uh, thanks everybody in our Georgetown alumni and uh, student community. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Jeff, for inviting me. Bye. Thanks so much for doing this.